can probiotics well I'll say pro pre all of them the family of biotics i don't think that makes sense actually but anyway can probiotics be harmful i think the definition from the world health organization means that by definition no you know they they are wild type bacteria that should confer a benefit to the host so i've never seen a case where ingestion of a probiotic has caused a problem that was actually the easiest answer. I know, right? I was like, oh, he's finished. <laughs> so, oh, okay. <laughs> one word out, so I was going to say I no. know. Uh, yeah. Oh, that, yeah. Even then, I'll be like, oh, right, we're back. Today's episode is sponsored by Simprove. Simprove is a live and active bacteria and liquid supplement designed to support your gut. Monday Science listeners can take advantage of a 15% discount on Simprove's 12-week program. Find out more at www.mondaysciencepodcast.com forward slash listen. Science, science, technology, technology, medicine, medicine, health, health. These four things make the world go round. Without them, we couldn't exist. This is the Monday Science Podcast, a weekly show bringing you the latest research and news in science, technology, medicine, and health, answering your questions or finding experts in the field to answer them. Your host is a pharmacist, an award-winning scientist. She leads her own research group and is the founder of King's College London Fight the Fakes, a tad bit on the qualified side. Welcome to Monday Science. Here's your host, Dr. Bahija Raimi Abraham. Hello and welcome back to Monday Science. Happy Monday. I hope your week has started off great. Today is episode 90. I cannot believe we're in episode 90. Soon we'll be at episode 100, 1000. Well, well, 1000 would be, it'll take a while. But anyway, how are you all today? Each Friday, we have Quiz Friday on our Instagram account. That's at Monday Science. And then the winners will be announced the following week. And as soon, we're going to start throwing in some giveaways, some prizes. So get involved. A question that I should really ask the listeners is what do we call ourselves or what what should I call you? Are you the Monday Sciences? I don't know. You know, every it's like people have, you know, like the beehive, the I mean, that's Beyonce's it's people. I don't know. Are, are we at the point where I can say the Monday Sciences, the Mon Size? I don't know. Maybe let us know what you would like to be called. You can send an email info at mondaysciencepodcast.com or you could just DM us. Monday Sciences, maybe? Just keep an awkward silence in there. Anyway, moving on. Today's Monday Science Person of the Week goes to Mona Gandhi, who's an associate professor in the School of Design and Construction, and her team in the Morphogenesis Lab received the World Architecture Award, and they won this award for a project that uses artificial intelligence and wearable technology to respond to people's emotions. Very interesting work. Congratulations. On to the news of the week. There is evidence to show that penguins might actually be aliens. Does that surprise anyone? I don't know. I'm, I've, I know some people find penguins cute. I find them cute in the context of happy feet. And I think it's, it's, that was the cartoon Madagascar. That is the only context I find them cute. In the zoo, they're okay, but they're very smelly. Um, Sorry to those who are real penguin fans. Researchers led by Dr. David Clements, who's a reader in astrophysics at Imperial College London. Interesting fact, I actually wanted to study astrophysics. I did physics A-level and on one of our, I can't remember what kind of days it was, but it was sort of like an experience day. We went to Imperial And I was very obsessed with quarks and everything. Astrophysics has always had a special place in my heart. When I had the social enterprise, well, still have the social enterprise, DMED Collective, and we were part of the Broccoli Street Art Festival. One of the walls that um, I curated was an astrophysics wall, which was highlighting a discovery of a supernova in the last, the first supernova in like the last 40 years. I find this stuff very interesting. And so these experts they found that in penguins' feces or excrement, otherwise known as guano, that's like bird 
excrement, bird and bat excrement, it's called guano. And so these experts learned that in penguins guano, let's call it that, there are traces of a chemical called phosphine. And whilst that may not seem like, you know, it's like, oh, okay, I'm sure there are loads of chemicals in people's excrement. But the interesting thing is the only place that phosphine has existed is on planet Venus. So how did it get there? Now, it could be, I mean, I, I am not an astrophysicist. I'm, I'm just theorizing. Could it be, because if it's in the penguin's excrement, could that mean that maybe they ate something that contained the phosphine isotope or whatever? It's just, I just say that because when I did the astrophysics wall, we learned that supernovas emit different elements. And one of the and different ions and various different things and and what elements and ions they emit it depends on the solar system in which they are so any astrophysicists that are listening you can please correct me if i'm wrong and come on the show and let's have a conversation about it but from what i remember one of the main elements that the supernova emitted this many years ago was iron and that's why we had iron in our blood that's why yeah, so the whole thing about iron. But anyway, shortly after the time we created the wall, they'd found an isotope that was linked. So iron isotope that was linked to the supernova. And they found that in bacteria. So I'm just wondering, is it that the penguins are like they can they are the uh, phosphine is within them? Or is it just maybe they like to eat something and also it depends on where they found these penguins, but side note. But yeah, is it that they just eat, they like to eat something that contains the isotope or contains this phosphine? Anyway, I don't know, but it's very interesting connecting uh, connecting space to our world. And uh, yeah, maybe there are more alien species around us. But I, what I found quite interesting, so Dr. Dave Clements, as I mentioned, who's the, he's a reader in astrophysics at Imperial College London. And he's one of the researchers that discovered the phosphine in the penguins excrement. He quoted in an article that they'd really like to study the penguins guano. Remember guano is um, bird excrement um, to understand the biology but it's quite hard for astronomers to get a grant proposal to go and play with penguins so we're trying to navigate through interdisciplinary fields and anyone who has listened to the podcast before you know I talk a lot about funding and how funding can limit because it can really limit innovation can limit science because you have to apply for funding based on what the funders think is novel and is of interest. I'm not saying it couldn't be of interest to, I mean, I I think it could be quite fascinating to learn a little bit more because maybe there's more connection to other planets that we don't know. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. So let's see how that unfolds. On to today's episode. Today's episode is a discussion with Professor Simon Gaysford about probiotics. And this is a three part um, episode series. This week, we're going to be talking about what are probiotics. Next week, we're going to talk about the health benefits of probiotics. And then they will have a third episode where we talk about the impact of good bacteria during COVID. On to today's episode, I have one of my favorite people finally getting to speak with you cornered you one of my mentors gives the best life advice and just absolutely amazing we have the professor simon gaysford hi simon that's a tremendous build up thank you b that's very nice of you uh, I should have had some drums to like really get us into it <laughs> but okay let's start, <laughs> let's start off well you've got a guitar in the background we could have uh I was going to say we could have played some music. That sounds a bit weird. Um, (laughs) That's brilliant. Okay, (laughs) Professor Simon Gaysford, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Right. Well, I am a professor of pharmaceutics at University College London. Been there a long time. Actually, I've been there since before. It was part of University College London. That's how long I've been there. So maybe 20 years. And I'm one of those lucky people that gets to um, to have a job that's his hobby. So I get to work. And it's a bit like going into my own shed and playing with the toys. So that's really tremendous. I run a research group. We look at uh, probiotic bacteria, which is what we're going to talk about today, I think. And we do some other stuff like 3D printing that captures people's imaginations. And I also teach on M Farm. So I've had the privilege of teaching a lot of people. And I've also had the privilege of seeing a lot of people turn into really wonderful 
and independent scientists such as yourself be. So that's very thank nice. You. And it's very nice that we're having this conversation. Because, so. Oh, thank you so much. First time I ever met you as what, as as at a thermal methods meeting in oh, GSK many years ago. They're fantastic, aren't they? Yeah, that was the first time. They were really good. All of my best friends I've met through the thermal analysis community. So, exactly. So you can imagine how frightening that is when they're all around the same table. <laughs> But today we're going to talk about probiotics. But beforehand, I want to ask you a couple of questions. What's your favourite song at the moment? That's a good one. So my favourite song at the moment is Here's to Us by Hailstorm. It's an absolutely fantastic song. And I'm learning to play it on guitar, which is why the guitar is behind me. So if anyone's thinking about a nice, easy song to learn on guitar, bring it up on YouTube and have a look. It's really good. And what about a film or book that you could also recommend? And I had to think about that film because I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a huge film uh, buff, but there are some films that I think are really good. And so I was going to recommend The Green Book. I saw it at the cinema when it came out. It's about uh, being black in uh, America during the 1950s. And, it, and the lead character is a guy that's got a PhD and is, um, is a pianist. But being black, he struggles with people even recognising that he has any talent. And so it's just, it's just a wonderful, wonderful film. So... If anyone wants to watch that, I highly recommend it. And I was going to recommend a book as well, because I like books. My favourite scientist is Richard Feynman. He wrote some tremendous books. But there's, there's a series of anecdotes of his life as a scientist, and they're called Surely You're Joking, Mr Feynman. So I recommend that. I remember the trailer for Green Book. It looks very good. Thank you for those recommendations. Right. So before we get into everything, I like to clarify terms because we have <laughs> listeners from scientific and non-scientific backgrounds. What are probiotics? So probiotics, that's the easiest one to define. And the reason it's easy is because the World Health Organization has defined it for us. So we don't have to argue about it. (laughs) So a probiotic is defined as a living organism, bacterial organism, which when swallowed in sufficient quantity provides a health benefit to the host. Is bacteria or also any microorganism or do we prefer bacteria? Yeah, I guess, in, I guess the way it's worded, it can be any living organism, but it really is taken to be bacteria. And, and when we look at what's inside us, we could also include yeasts in that, but in the main, it's bacteria. I feel that maybe the next one might be a little bit more difficult to determine. Prebiotics. Because I didn't know much about prebiotics. I still don't, hence why you're here. But um, yeah. I remember when we had early conversations and um, you talked about the synergy between pro and prebiotics. And I was like, mm-hmm, sounds great. What are prebiotics? Yeah, no World Health Organization definition there, but a prebiotic is essentially a food stuff for a probiotic. So obviously, if you're going to swallow a bacterium and you're swallowing it because you want it to improve your health, the only way it's going to do that is if it can grow. And what's the best way of growing? Go down to McDonald's and eat something. So what <laughs> you want is a food stuff that you like. And so a prebiotic is a food stuff that the probiotic likes. Oh, I see. And because we don't really tend to hear a lot about prebiotics, or maybe I say we, I, but you, the narrative seems to be more about probiotics than prebiotics. And I'm guessing that might be influencing also how people formulate or what we get on the commercial market, right? Yeah, I think that's true. So if you go back a few years, I think there was a bit of a recognition that some foodstuffs were good for supporting your gut bacteria. So when I was a kid, I remember my aunt, mad aunt, would eat alpen every morning <laughs> it just seems to be like a bowl of impenetrable <laughs> sawdust but she used to eat um alpen and she used to say i'm eating this because it's rough rich and it's good <laughs> it's good for my guts <laughs> even though it would take her about two days to plow through one bowl of it so i guess in the past yeah the narrative as you say was about eating stuff because people generally thought it was it was okay for your gut and i think the narrative has moved on slightly and actually if you look at a lot of the breakfast cereals and I have to tell you I'm not a big advocate of breakfast cereals but a lot of them now are starting to be fortified with either probiotics you can you can get breakfast cereals with probiotics or they will say prebiotics and so they're really trying to capture that public imagination and make you think like you're eating this but you're also nurturing your bacteria yeah that's uh when you said roughage we need to have you come back and talk specifically about roughage which (laughs) can't wait this episode is sponsored by simprove simprove is a live and active bacteria liquid supplement designed to support your gut simprove is founded on the belief that recovering and maintaining a healthy gut balance can help you live a fuller life monday science listeners can take advantage of a 15 percent 
discount on Simproof's 12-week program using the code MONSAI15. Why 12 weeks? Because it takes 12 weeks for dietary changes to take effect. Also, the British Society of Gastroenterology guidelines recommend 12 weeks when trying bacteria-based supplements. Simproof comes in two very tasty flavors, mango and passion fruit, and an original flavor. This offer is available only to Monday Science listeners for new customers and one-time use. Find out more at www.mondayscienceodcast.com forward slash listen. But okay, so we've got probiotics, we've got prebiotics, and now another third one that I don't really understand, symbiobiotics. Yeah, symbiotics. Symbiotics. Words here, and they're very similar. So symbiotic and symbiotic. Ah. Symbiotic means two organisms living in harmony with each other. So you could take the view, actually, that a probiotic, if you swallowed it and it colonised your guts and it was living inside you, is symbiotic because it's living in harmony with you, two organisms. And symbiotic means a combination of a prebiotic and a probiotic. So it would mean a bacterium and a food stuff together. The, the, the both words meaning together, the whole is bigger than either of its parts. So either two living organisms, symbiotic, or a living organism and a food stuff, symbiotic. Oh, so syn as in from synergy, mm-hmm. like the word synergy. Ah, oh, okay, that's interesting. Okay, so you've explained how they all work together, or is there anything else you'd like to add with how they work together? No, um, that's a good basis for, for which... Are you still we... stuck on roughage? <laughs> um, okay, so do we have symbiotic or and symbiotic? We do. So okay. I think there's a growing recognition that if you look at your body in a whole, it doesn't matter where you look, there probably are going to be some bacteria. There are places when there probably aren't, so inside your brain, for instance, and all that sort of thing. Uh, there bacteria in there, but if you look at the, the parts of your body which are exposed to the outside world, like up your nose, in your mouth, you know, mm. GI tract, that, generally you find bacteria living inside the human body, okay? It's just that in some parts of the body, there are more bacteria than in other parts of the body. And so as you go down your GI tract, and so if people are aware of what that is i always say it's from tum to bum but i say that because it's easy to remember it's actually from mouth to bum but that doesn't rhyme <laughs> so just remember it's tum to bum so tum to bum is your g- gast- uh, gastrointestinal tract as you go further down that um, tract the number of bacteria start to get really really high so if we look at our stomach very few bacteria because the stomach actually it contains acid and the reason it contains acid one reason is to stop bacteria just coming in from the environment but as we get further and further down, once we get to the colon, there are trillions and trillions of bacteria. And in a typical human being, 90% of the cells in your body are bacterial. There is a great book called 10% Human. Uh, and, and, the, and the point of that book is essentially it's talking about your gut bacteria. And it's, and it's called 10% Human because only 10% of the cells that make up your whole body are yours. The other 90% are bacterial. Oh, wow. And if that. someone said, well, that's a bit weird. How can 90% of me be bacterial? The answer is that a human cell is much bigger than a bacterium. So you can have many, many more bacterial cells. They're smaller. That's very interesting. What happens to your natural pro and prebiotics when you take uh, supplements? Yeah, so we have to be careful with the word probiotic because a probiotic means an organism which, which does something that's beneficial for you. And we should be clear that in your gastrointestinal tract, you already have trillions of bacteria that are doing good things for you, okay? So really, what you're doing is supplementing your own bacteria with a few more bacteria from outside. And most of the bacteria that you buy in probiotic supplements, they were originally isolated from humans. They're not, so it's not some sort of alien species that we're trying to introduce. And the way I like to think about it, I think we might come onto this topic um, in a little bit when we talk about how they work is it's really, you have a number of organisms in your gut, types of organisms. Some of them are good, some of them less good. And really when that balance between good and bad starts to tilt in favor of bad, that's when you start to get some gut symptoms and it can lead to a whole range of different diseases, which also we might talk about uh, in a bit. And so the reason I think it's important to supplement with probiotics is because you're trying to redress that balance. So whatever you're doing with your lifestyle, you could stress, smoking, alcohol, not exercising, poor diet, whatever it is, that can help tilt the balance of bacteria in your gut from, from predominantly good to predominantly bad. And, and the point about supplementing is you're just adding 
bacteria that you would ordinarily have, you're just adding more. Before we get onto how they all work together, if you're, because I didn't really understand, there are many things I didn't really understand, but I think to a lay person, if you're saying the word probiotics, and if you look at how probiotics are advertised in the media, where they talk about, ooh, supporting your good bacteria, you would think that it's adding something new into your system yeah. to yeah. support whatever's there, you know. And then there's now even listening to what you're saying, even more so, isn't there a risk or is there a risk of overproduction of one type of the bacteria because you're adding more of it do you see what i mean yeah no i no, you raise good points actually so so one of the first um probiotic species and um, discovered it was discovered in human feces so you know in the early 1900s people are working with what they can get their hands on <laughs> and that point, that's everything they get their hands on and so they isolated the most common bacterium from human feces and it's a species called an enterococcus and they called it Fecium, because it was identified in feces. And so Enterococcus fecium is a really common bacterium, which is really prevalent in the human gut. And there are lots of others. Okay, there's another really common one is Lactobus infantum. And that's one that comes from breast milk. And again, it's easy to isolate because when women have given birth and they're breastfeeding, they are producing these bacteria because they want to start to colonize the gut. It's really important. That's a, and that's a whole separate conversation that we can have about cesarean births, births versus natural birth, breastfeeding versus not breastfeeding. I think people are starting to understand that one of the consequences of those decisions is the gut flora later on. Okay. So I, I think that if you look at each individual person's gut <laughs> with a microscope or some binoculars or something, you would see that they have a huge diversity of species of bacteria probably somewhere in the region of six to 10,000 different species. But many of those species are going to be in very low number. And what you generally find is there are some groups of bacteria that tend to predominate. They've got fancy names. They tend to be things like Thermocutes and Bacteroides. So they're, they're, really, they're the really big groups of bacteria. So really the, the probiotics that you buy from the supermarkets, they are also in those groups of bacteria. So when you swallow them, you're not really, you're not fundamentally changing your gut flora. And there's a lot of studies to say that even if you had a sustained course of antibiotics or something, something relatively catastrophic for your gut bacteria, you still generally recover the same proportion of bacteria you had before. So um, it's quite, I think it's quite difficult to change to change, fundamentally change your gut bacteria. But I, I do think a lot of disease states are starting to be linked with um, an imbalance in your gut, in your gut flora. And really that's where probiotics can come in. And, and that imbalance can be made a lot worse by antibiotics, for instance. I have so many questions. I'm trying to make sure I don't bombard because I still want to go to the question of how they all work together. But it's interesting what you were saying. And I was thinking, for for me, I used to take um, a probiotic brand. They're not sponsoring the episode, so I'm not saying who they are. <laughs> and, and I noticed a difference between when I took one of their products that did it was just different probiotics, and another one that actually had different bacteria. Sorry, and another one that had uh, a yeast in there that that mm -hmm. seemed to work. And is there sometimes a chance that if something works for you, it's because maybe you have that organism at a lower level. So then that helps. To I think a lot of people ask me a slightly different question, but it's related. And they say, which probiotic should I take? And, and they might present me with a range of symptoms first, which is kind of disturbing, actually, when you don't know someone. <laughs> and then they say, which, which probiotic should I, should I take? And, and I suppose really how a probiotic works in your body is going to be different from how it works in my body. And like all living organism, organisms, bacteria like a particular environment. So I might, for instance, have a different pH or a, or a different fluid volume in my, in my gut than yours. And so different bacteria will grow preferentially in me than in you. It might also be the case that if, for instance, Saccharomyces is a very common yeast um, probiotic species, that's it, the it that was the sorry that was the yeast that was in in there yeah well it's a, it's a it's a type of yeast and then there'll be a word after it that, that gives you the actual um, species so cerevisia it might well be that it may, maybe you didn't have so much yeast and so by taking a supplement which has got yeast in it the yeast isn't trying to compete with other yeast that's already there it's suddenly got a, a whole playing field to itself and so it can proliferate and you feel different it might well have been the case that if you had lots of yeast already and you took a probiotic containing a yeast, you wouldn't have felt any different because those, those yeast that you're swallowing, they couldn't proliferate because they're already a huge number of 
yeast's already there. Hmm? So really, I think it comes down to what you've already got in your gut flora. And it's about trying different products and seeing how you feel. <laughs> and it's very difficult, and then we're coming off of it, it's very difficult to say exactly how a probiotic works. And I normally say to people, try different probiotics. Go to the supermarket and look at the different products that are available. Look at the labels and see which bacteria they contain. Try and choose products that contain different um, species or different, um, different blends of species. Uh, and just try and if you feel better, go with that one, <laughs> which nice. is what you're saying, which is what you do. Yeah, exactly. How do they all work together? Yeah, so we, we've spent a, a lot of time over the last few years trying to understand how probiotics work. That's really what the groups, my research group's main focus has been for probiotics. And so we've kind of boiled it down to a relatively simple mechanism. And I'm, and I'm sure that I'm sure that in the long run, it will turn out to be a bit more complex than what we've discovered so far. But the way we interpret it is like this. Generally, probiotic species are grouped under a special name and they're called lactic acid bacteria. So when you go to the supermarket and you see something that's got a lactobacillus on it, for instance, then they always lactobacillus, they produce lactic acid. That's really why they're called that. So think of, think of any of us going down to McDonald's and we go and eat a nice burger and a day later we produce some feces. So we eat something, we produce some waste. Bacteria are no different. They can't use the drive through at McDonald's because they're too small to press the button. So they have to eat something. So they eat foodstuffs that they find around in their environment. Obviously, they're not eating burgers. They're, eat they're eating small molecules. And like all living creatures, they produce waste products. So rather than producing a big load of feces like we do, these bacteria produce lactic acid. Okay. So, so as they're living and growing, they're just pumping out lactic acid. Now, for those people that are familiar with the term acids, most people think, oh, acid, that's bad. Hydrochloric acid and, and sulfuric acid, those are bad, okay? But lactic acid is a very weak acid. And so you can tolerate quite a lot of that in your gut. So, so these bacteria produce lactic acid and they lower pH. I'm kind of hoping that most of your listeners are kind of familiar with the concept yeah. of pH. So lower means a sort of more acidic environment. So they lower the pH. So we've done lots of testing where we've looked at bacteria that live natively in the gut. So they would be, say, the good bacteria. And we've looked at bacteria which don't live natively in the gut. So they would be infectious bacteria. So things like E. coli, MRSA, C. diff, you know, the sort of things people are kind of worried about. Shigella is another one. So we've looked at those. What we've discovered is those bacteria are not very good at surviving at low pH. Okay, so what we think happens is you take the probiotics as a supplement, they arrive in your colon, they start to grow, and in growing they produce lactic acid. The lactic acid starts to lower the pH because it's an acid, and so that makes it challenging for all the bacteria around. <laughs> but, the one, but the bacteria that live natively in your colon are usually quite good at surviving low pH, the bacteria that are not native aren't so good at surviving low pH. And in our testing, if you've got a, an infection, so a C. diff infection, for instance, just taking the probiotic and allowing the pH to drop generally destroys the infection. So that's good. So a lot of people say, why would I take a probiotic if I've got a gut infection? And that's why. <laughs> so that's good. The other thing, and people ask me this a lot, and it's a very good question, if I kept taking probiotics, every day, wouldn't I end up acidifying my gut? Because it'd just be full of lactic acid. That's a very good question. <laughs> and so your body is really good at returning to its original state. It's called homeostasis, which is Greek for keeping things the same. So the natural pH in your gut is going to be somewhere between five and a half to six and a half. And so your body is perfectly um, adapted to maintaining that pH. So in this case, what will happen is that the probiotics produce lactic acid and that will drop the pH. It probably drop it to around four and a half. But that lactic acid, which is a small molecule, the good bacteria in your gut, they see lactic acid as a foodstuff. And so the lactic acid concentration starts to rise 
and they think fantastic it's like it's like Deliveroo has arrived <laughs> and so and so they do they gorge themselves on the lactic acid and in so doing they grow and they multiply and you get this cascade effect actually and so what happens is some bacteria they will produce a compound called acetate some compound uh, some bacteria will produce propionate and some produce butyrate i know there's a lot of technical terms Collectively, those are known as short chain fatty acids. And you often see in the media this word, short chain fatty acids, and it's usually an indicator of good gut health. So what we found is the probiotics produce lactic acid. It helps destroy the bad bacteria. And at the same time, it's a food stuff for your good bacteria. And in eating the lactic acid, they produce all of these short chain fatty acids. And the short chain fatty acids, butyrate in particular, are just, they're just hugely implicated in good gut health. Hmm. Yeah. That's, that's what we think. Of. So is there any, I mean, from what you're saying, I was thinking, oh, so is, could there be potential for probiotics to be used as a treatment instead of antibiotics? If it was me and I was in hospital, hmm. and we've got to be careful while you're in hospital. If you've got, if you've got an infection in your blood, for instance, so you're on the way to septicemia and stuff, antibiotics are really critical because you need to kill that infection really quickly and and um, any consequential damage to your gut flora is less important okay but if you've got a gut infection so nothing else elsewhere in your body just in your body, i think a probiotic would be a really good way forward because it should in in one sense treat that infection and at the same time it should encourage your good bacteria to grow I have spent many times going around hospitals explaining to doctors why you might want to use probiotics to treat uh, C. diff infections, for instance. And one of the issues with the NHS is you have a thing called pathway of care. So what that means is when you arrive in hospital with a particular condition, there will be a pathway of care for that condition, which is essentially a lot of doctors over the years have decided the best treatment course is this pathway of care. And it's very difficult to get a doctor to move away from the pathway of care. Because if something went wrong, you're going to sue the doctor for not following the pathway of care. And the pathway of care for gut infections says, start with an antibiotic, but not the most effective antibiotic, because there's a risk of generating antibiotic resistance. So you start with the sort of lower grade antibiotic. And generally, that has the consequence of destroying some of your good bacteria and not touching the infection. Then you give the next level of antibiotic, which kills more of the good bacteria and sort of leaves the infection. And quite often, a patient will end up a raging infection in their gut, which is now multi-drug resistant because they've gone through a whole series of antibiotics and their natural gut flora has almost been destroyed. I, I personally know several people that have ended up in intensive care uh, with a multi-drug resistant E. coli infection. Uh, and at that point, there were no treatment options because there are no antibiotic left. And so the only treatment left in some hospitals is fecal transplant from a healthy donor. And I really do think that um, intervention with probiotics at a sooner stage could have a massive difference. Even if you give antibiotics, if you give an antibiotic, say, at nine in the morning, and you're going to give another antibiotic at five in the afternoon, maybe at one o'clock, take a probiotic because it's helping to support your your gut bacteria, which, which are under assault from the antibiotics. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's really where probiotics, at least medically, can um, make a difference. And I should say, before, before we finish this answer, that the FDA, so that's the body in America that uh, approves medicines in America. The FDA recognises two terms for uh, bacteria as treatment. So you said um, bacteria use as treatment. So if, um, if a probiotic, so what a natural, a naturally occurring bacterium, so not something that's been modified in a laboratory, but naturally occurring species, if it can be shown that taking that species has a medical benefit, then it's called a next generation probiotic, NGP. It's a, it's a special term by the FDA. If you genetically modified a bacterium, to produce a compound which was therapeutic. So let's say you took an E. coli and you genetically modified it to produce an antibiotic, for instance. You could swallow it, it would proliferate and it would produce this antibiotic. That's called a live biotherapeutic product, LBP. So there are two terms that the FDA uh, recognizes for these products. 
the, the tricky bit, I think, is the medical world is set up for tablets, tablets and capsules, as you know, or fixed dose. So if I said to you, right, PJ, go to Boots and buy a 200 milligram ibuprofen tablet and you swallow it, you know you're getting 200 milligrams of ibuprofen, that's fine. If I said to you, go to the supermarket and buy a probiotic product and swallow it, you, you don't know how many of those bacteria are going to survive, they're going to colonize. You've you just got no idea. And so the regulatory body is very nervous about using probiotics as a medical treatment because it can't control the dose. Yeah, we're going to have to have a follow up conversation because I've just got a research idea <laughs> I want to talk to you about. It's interesting because one of as you know, I, I went on a secondment at the European Medicines Agency. And one of the reasons why I wanted to understand the regulatory environment was to understand to some extent the limitations and the advantages as well, but how regulatory environments work, because I do feel that, and particularly from this conversation as well, that there's so many things that people are researching, but there's, and I'm not blaming the regulatory body, but I'm just saying there's so many things that people are researching and it's so hard to then get them into the clinic because of, you know, the mm -hmm. regulatory environment or the regulatory setting is the gateway between and it can be viewed as obviously the line to protect the patient but it is the gateway mm -hmm. to a lot of of different things and in particular it's also interesting to see how different regulatory bodies across the world operate you know and I, I do feel and so this is another day's conversation but it does look as if sometimes people globally look to the FDA to see what they've approved and then everyone else is like, oh, if they've gone through it, then maybe it should be okay. But we'll have I think a... that's true, although obviously with the coronavirus vaccine, it's the other way around, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, we approved first. But yeah, I, I agree with that. And the other thing, as you know, because I remember you going on that comment, is that the regulatory bodies care about three things, which is safety, quality and efficacy. Efficacy meaning how good a product um, works. And that's really difficult for a probiotic product. Safety, because you can't guarantee that it won't morph into something else. <laughs> Bacteria are really good at swapping bits of DNA. <laughs> so that's a difficult quality for the same reason. You can, you can manufacture some bacteria or grow some bacteria, but a day later they've turned into something else. And that's difficult. Uh, and efficacy, because, because it's totally related to how those bacteria have grown in your body. And so that I do think that the regulatory body just, they can't get their collective heads around how to deal with uh, bacteria as therapeutic treatments. And so it's easier to just say no. Can probiotics, well, I'll say pro, pre, all of them, the family of biotics, I don't think that makes sense actually. But anyway, can probiotics be harmful? I think the definition from the World Health Organization means that by definition, no. You know, they, they are wild type bacteria that should confer a benefit to the host. So I've never seen a case where ingestion of a probiotic has caused a problem. That was actually the easiest answer. I know, right? I was like, oh, he's finished. <laughs> so, oh, okay. <laughs> one word out, so I, was say I no. know. Yeah. Oh, even then I'll be like, oh, right, we're back. You've been listening to the Monday Science Podcast, a weekly show bringing you the latest research and news in science, technology, medicine and health we hope you've gotten some useful and thought-provoking info from the show and we hope you had fun along the way we know we did we'll be back soon but in the meantime hook up with us on our website at www.mondayscientepodcast.com shoot us an email at info at mondayscientepodcast.com Find us on Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube at Monday Science and access episode summaries at mondayscience.medium.com. See you next week on the Monday Science Podcast.